<clears throat> last evening of lectures on taking charge of your health. Tomorrow, remember that at uh, 4 p.m., we're going to meet for our cooking class. We're going to meet for our cooking class. Um, Leah, I'm going to ask if we can make sure that, I know that I was asked by at least one person yesterday to know exactly where the room will be. Can we make sure to point them all to it? It's, it's pretty much right out these doors further down to your right. Say again. The first building on your left from the parking lot. Yeah, first building on your left from the parking lot. That's where we're going to be doing the uh, cooking demo tomorrow. And that is going to be at 4 p.m., okay? So please make sure you're there. And uh, if I'm correct, my wife says she's going to have all of the uh, recipes that she's going to make. She's going to have it all printed out for you all or have it printed. So that way you'll be able to have that. And then you'll get to taste it and see for yourself how it is. So let's look forward to that at 4 o'clock tomorrow, the cooking class. Also, quick reminder that we are going to have a program that's very special. I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask you to be a company of soldiers with us on this. That whoever you know that is either potentially diabetic, pre-diabetic, diabetic, you want to let them know that in January, January, right now, the dates that I have, I've, I'm going to go ahead and say these are tentative. I won't say it's exact. But right now, January 9 through January 25. We are looking to have a program here called Diabetes Undone. This program has had sweeping success throughout the nation. Dr. Wes Youngberg put this program together. It is an excellent program, and it really helps individuals to overcome their type 2 diabetes. So if you know of anyone, or if you want to learn, or what have you, please let us know. This is going to be a very exciting program. And I, again, will be your uh, facilitator for that. Say again. Will, th will this be on YouTube as well? Yes. yes. OK, good. So it's going to be every Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. Every Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. Uh, typically, it's going to probably be either 6 or 7 o'clock. It goes on for about an hour and a half. And we're going to go ahead and cover a lot of information. You get to taste food every night. You have food prepared for you. I mean, it's going to be very, very powerful. Um, so that's going to happen again January 2024. That's going to be January 9 through January 25. Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday are the tentative dates. We will make, that's why I make sure that no later than tomorrow we have all of your contact information so that way we can follow back up with you and then let you know that everything is rock solid for that series, Diabetes Undone. Really excellent program. And we have many more programs we're looking to do um, throughout the year of 2024. We have learned that it is very important to be relevant in your community. And one of the ways to be relevant in the community is when you help meet people in their most practical needs, how to eat, how to drink, how to live, etc. This is what folks need to know today. All right. So I'm very excited that we can do that. So just look forward to a lot of good things coming from the Granite Bay Folsom group out here. Um, with that being stated, I am going to go ahead and dive into our subject. I already prayed earlier, so I stand under that prayer. We're going to talk about total temperance. Total temperance. This is a very exciting subject. This is a very uh, powerful subject. It's a challenging subject, but I know that we all can do it because we have all the help that we need. You'll remember we talked from the beginning of our meetings all the way up until last night about these laws of health. And we put it together in an acronym through all the letters in yellow called God's plan. Okay, God's plan. And it is through this that we're going to talk about always temperate. All right, always temperate. Now, the word temperance is not really a common word used today by the average person having a dialogue with folks. So when we think about the question, what is temperance, the better way to understand that is through this word, which is self-control. Every time you think of the word temperance, think what? Self-control, okay, self-control. Now, there are some synonyms to this idea of self-control. Self-discipline or self-mastery. Could any of us use a little bit more discipline or a little more self-mastery? Oh yeah, absolutely, right? These are things that we battle with. Now, in the world today, we have a lot of thought leaders 
that, uh, you know, kind of have accomplished extraordinary things. And sometimes people go to them to say, hey, how did you do it? One of the examples is the late Kobe Bryant. For those who were basketball fans or anything like that, um, you know, he died in 2020 through a terrible helicopter accident along with his precious daughter and some other individuals on the helicopter. But, you know, he accomplished amazing things in his art and in his craft. So when he was asked the question in relation to self-discipline and self-mastery, here's what he said. I have self-doubt. I have insecurity. I have fear of failure. I have nights when I show up at the arena and I'm like, my back hurts, my feet hurt, my knees hurt. I don't have it. I just want to chill. We all have self-doubt. You don't deny it, but you also don't capitulate to it. You embrace it. It is these type of thought processes today that has caused a lot of individuals to go from failures to successes. It's not only in the world of sports, but in the world of finances, in business ownership. It was Elon Musk who said, never, I don't ever give up. I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. For my part, I will never give up, and I mean never. I wonder if a lot of people took on this kind of mindset, how much further we'd be in life goals. If sometimes we would say, I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep pushing forward. I'm not going to stop. Sometimes we don't arrive to the places we want to be, whether it's with physical goals, mental goals, financial goals, domestic goals. A lot of times we don't hit our goals because we lack that self-discipline. We lack that self-mastery. But then we look at people who have accomplished some pretty big things in our world, and we see this continual attitude. It was Thucydides, uh, the Greek philosopher and historian, that he says self-control is the chief element in self-respect. And respect of self, in turn, is the chief element in courage. So that in our world today, not looking even in the religious sector, you will see that there are many people who have accomplished extraordinary things. And they were able to do it because there was a focus and a settling of mind that allowed them to accomplish what they needed to accomplish. And in my mind, I feel this way about it. If individuals are not looking to God for strength or help to do what they need to do and still able to accomplish their goals, how is it that we have God, but yet we still find ourselves failing so much and not accomplishing our goals? Something needs to change. And that's why we talk a lot about total temperance, because the reality is, is that there's a lot of things I'm sure. I don't know about you. I have tons of goals. Do you all still have goals in your life? You still got some things that you want to accomplish, things you want to see happen, whether it's for you personally or for your loved ones. And also, remember, we are right at the close of the year. And psychologically speaking, we do go in a little bit of reset of thinking whenever we arrive at a new year. Isn't that right? We say, this year, I'm going to accomplish this and this and this and this and this. So this is a, a very timely message for us when we're talking about total temperance. Now, Two things helps to sum up temperance or self-control. There, there are two things that ultimately are right there as the foundation of practicing self-control. The first one is learning how to say no. How many of us have a problem saying no? Seriously, there, there's some of us who battle with this, and I, I really appreciate you, you, you raising your hand because some of us are, are so servant-oriented that sometimes we will say yes even to our own personal harm. And that is not good. Sometimes you need to learn how to say no. And remember, saying no doesn't mean that your eyebrows go from here to here. Are you following that? In other words, saying no doesn't mean you have to be mean about it. I've learned that you can say no with a smile. Sometimes when people are like, hey, can you come by? Hey, can you do this? You can say, no, I'm sorry, I can't. You know, you see that big smile? It's like, but you, you still said no. <laughs> And sometimes we need to learn how to do that. I, I, have, I, have, I have a lot of problems, but this, this is one of my problems, is I say yes a lot. Because, you know, I get people who come to me and sometimes they treat it like the world will come to an end if I don't take time for them. And so here it is. I have learned this. Oh, by the way, y'all like secrets? I'm going to let you in on a secret. If you want to die nice and early, listen to this secret. Try being God. It'll take you to an early grave. When you go around thinking that you could save people, 
and that you can be the deliverer and all these other things, you will discover the limitations of your abilities very quickly. And the more that we try to be God, to know it all, to see it all, and to do it all, that is a formula for absolute self-destruction. And so I am learning to tell people, listen, if somebody comes to me, Dwayne, it's an emergency, you know, whatever, there are times that I'll say, okay, I'm available. But there are some other times that I'm saying, I'm sorry, but I'm not available right now, but I will pray for you. And I want you to remember that God is always accessible and you can go to him even at this moment. And I have learned to do that because I have a lot of minister friends that are powerless in their influence today because they died perhaps early deaths. You gotta learn how to say no sometimes for your own health, for your own benefit. But not only that, we also gotta learn how to say no to things that we know are hurting us. You know, sometimes we get little temptations in life and sometimes we don't know how to say no. This is one of the reasons why this little verse is a very helpful verse I know for me. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist or say no to the devil and he will flee from you. We gotta learn sometimes to say no, even when everything in us wants to say yes. And it's gonna require discipline. It's gonna require self-control. Now, I said two things, well this is one thing. The first thing we need to learn in self-control is learning how to say no. For some of us, we need to learn how to do that. But what do you think is the other thing we need to learn? Can anybody guess? If the first thing in self-control is learning how to say no, what do you think is the second thing we need to learn in self-control? Learning how to say yes. There are some of us that sometimes we're good at saying no. Hey, Dwayne, can you do, no. Hey, can you do, no. Hey, can you please, no. Some of us are actually good at saying no, and sometimes it's hard for us to say yes because we're afraid of commitment. You ever met somebody like that? They're, they, they, they're way more comfortable saying, nope, sorry, I'm not available. Nope, sorry, can't do it. Nope, not available, can't try. Oh, but what about this? You throw a thousand options at them, and they always find a way to say no. Why? Because sometimes they're afraid to say yes. Why? Because then they say, oh, man, I'm committed now. And for some people, commitment can be very, very scary. Here goes a time when Jesus himself, everything in him, said no. The Bible says, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He was finally willing to say yes. And there's a whole lot of people in this world today that are very happy that Jesus ultimately said yes. And so the reality is, is that when we're talking about learning self-control, learning how to practice self-discipline or self-mastery, the first thing we want to remember is that self-control is often manifested in two ways. Learning how to say no to things that are bad for us and learning how to say yes to things that are good for us. You ever had a little voice in your head said, you know you haven't exercised for the past week, you need to exercise. And everything in you is saying no. But we need to learn how to say what? Yes, exactly, you get that? Sometimes, you walk certain places and you see and smell certain foods and everything inside of you says, yes. But then a little voice in your head is saying, turn around, put your hand in your pocket, walk away and say no. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So, so it, it literally can go both ways. We, this, this is temperance. Temperance is learning how to say no to that which is bad for us and learning how to say yes to that which is good for us. It is not an easy thing to do, but it is possible. Now, what I'm about to let you in on is a very powerful key. What I'm about to show you here is the key to success in many areas of life. Many, perhaps all areas of life. Are you ready for this? I want you to watch this little lesson right here. This is a powerful lesson when we're talking about practicing more self-control, learning how to say no to that which is wrong, learning how to say yes to that which is right, Sometimes we feel like, well, well, how do I really do this? Here's a wisdom key. And I love the fact that it does come from the Bible, but it's not limited to biblical themes. It is applicable to every area of life. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. Here's the principle. 
He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. What's the lesson that this, what's the practical lesson of life that this verse is teaching us? You, are, you can talk to me. What's, what's the practical lesson of life that this verse is teaching us? That's absolutely. The, not only do the little things matter as much as the big things matter, how I and how you, how we address the little areas of life is a predictor of how we're going to address the larger areas of life. So if you want to learn how to say yes to the big decisions in life, learn how to say yes to the small decisions of life. If you want to learn how to say no to the big decisions of life, learn how to say no to the small decisions of life. The secret is how you handle the little decisions. It's how you handle the little decisions. This is your line of success, but sadly, this can also be our line of failure, is we must learn how to be faithful, how to do what's right, how to say yes to the little things and to say no to the little things that are bad for us. And the more that you do that, now think about it. How many of us sometimes say, ah, it's just a little thing. So I know it's bad, but it's just a little thing. You know what I'm talking about? You get what I'm talking about? Sometimes we say, it's just a little thing, so it doesn't matter. So we go ahead and make a bad decision on a little thing. But what's the predictor? Is if I'm making bad decision on little things, what's going to happen? I am going to make bad decisions on big things. So if you want to really start making some game changes, I really believe that with this, two, you know, 2023 is pretty much done. We're, we're down to a, a little bit, like a month and a half, just about a little under that. And, and we're done with this year. The year flew by once again. And I don't know about you, but I know that my wife and I, we, my wife and I talk a lot about goal setting. I mean, we talk a lot about goal setting. We keep our minds there. And we talk a lot about, okay, there were things we wanted to accomplish this year. What did we accomplish? What did we not accomplish? And why? And then we're like, all right, how are we going to come out the gate strong this year coming? And we talk about that. And I'm telling you, if, if you want to get me excited, let's, talk, let's sit down and talk about goal setting. I love doing stuff like that because that's productive. You know, the wives sit around and mope with each other like, oh, there's 20 things I didn't do this year. How about you? I beat you. I, there's 30 things I didn't do. And we just kind of go into this little misery pattern. It's like, no, look, the past is behind us. We can't change it. But we, hope we still have today and we still have a future ahead of us. We need to literally start saying, what are we going to do this year that's going to be the game changer? For me, for my family, there are three things that I am. I am a father, I am a husband, and I am a man of service in many different areas of life. So those are three things that I'm always asking myself. Okay, Dwayne, 2023 is gone. You boy, today was one of the best Sabbaths I had in, 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 in a long time. I sat down and it was just like a, my family and I, we were all together and I was talking with one of my daughters and the heart exchanges that was taking place, my wife and I saw a powerful breakthrough today. Amen. And we were just like, whoa. And it was so glorious. And in my mind, it just fired me up. I said, oh man. So, you know, my, you know, we're all gone, prayed and everything and moved on. And, I, and, and on my drive here, I just called. I said, honey, I said, what did you see today? And she told me what she saw and then what I saw. And we were just like, oh, wasn't it so powerful? And we were just, we, you know, we're all about forward. We're all about progress. How are we going to do better? And I'm sorry, but I, I'd like, mediocrity is like the name of the game for most people. But it shouldn't be for us. There's big things that I believe God wants you to accomplish. And I know for sure there's big things he wants for me to accomplish. But there's no way I'm going to accomplish it if I have no self-discipline. There's no way I'm going to accomplish it if I can't finally master some of these things that keep holding me back. So again, what's one of the secrets? Hey, this next goal setting time period that you're setting for yourself, what's the little things that you keep cheating on? Cheating yourself on. What are those little things that you just keep, ah, not a big deal, whatever. 
tomorrow, next week, you know, and tomorrow, next week keeps turning into year after year after year. What is it that you're finally going to get just a little bit, maybe, I don't know, sick and tired of it and say, you know what? It's about time we, 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 we make a different decision. And you'd be amazed at where you can be. I'm very excited to see where I can be, and I hope you're excited to see where you can be. So again, self-control in small areas of life prepares us to be self-controlled in the larger areas. Don't ever forget that, okay? Don't forget that. Self-control in small areas of life prepares us to be self-controlled in the larger areas. And the reason that this is important is because I go to an average person and say, hey, did you know that you should get at least five, day, five days a week of, of some good exercise? They don't go, oh, that's so deep. Are you serious? They don't say that. They say, what do they usually say? I know. You go to somebody and say, hey, did you know that you, know, you need to drink more water and less soda and juice? You know, you don't wash your clothes in soda and juice. Why are you washing your organs with soda and juice? <laughs> you know? It's like, drink more water. And if you tell them, hey, do you know you should drink more water? They don't go, oh, Water? What an idea. What are they saying? They're like, yeah, I know I need to drink more water. You go to people and say, you know, you know, you need to get good sleep. You got to get about eight hours of sleep. They don't say, really? I thought for some reason it was four. It's like every, most people know, yeah, I know I'm supposed to get good sleep, but what's the problem? We're just not doing what we already know. <laughs> And this is why I believe the greatest trial that we're in right now is a trial of intemperance. We are just not very self-controlled. For something has happened to us where we're just, our discipline is just a little bit weak and challenged, and we need to change that because that's what's going to get you to some of the greatest joys of life waiting for you, waiting for me. So the negative impact of losing control of ourselves you know, there's a lot of things out there where we can lose control of ourselves, and it's not good. And there's some pretty negative impacts that come with it. I'm going to give you an example. If I were to look at it even from biblical stories, I'm, you know one of the things that I like about the Bible? It's very honest. The Bible doesn't just tell any book that just tells you the good stories of people, you got to be afraid of that book. But I like the fact that the Bible talks about heroes, not so much in their good times, but also in their bad. Here's an example. Moses loses control as a result of the people's rebellion and his own distrust in God. Did you know that Moses one time lost, Moses was called the meekest man on earth, but here it is, Moses lost control. And it cost him Canaan. He couldn't go into Canaan land. because Just a moment where he lost control of himself. And God said to him, that's it. You are not allowed to go in Canaan land anymore. And, and it's, it's interesting, if you read the Bible carefully, Moses actually came to God later on like, please. It's almost like a child. You know, like when you tell a child, that's it, you can't do it anymore. And then what does a child do? Oh, daddy, please. Moses literally did that with God. He said, Lord, please. And God, God not only said no again, God said no and don't come back to me and talk about it again. Like literally, I mean, you read this in the Bible, okay? So Moses is instructing his buddy Joshua, and Moses is like, all right, Joshua, well, you go ahead and lead the people. You know they're a rough people now. And he gives Joshua all the counsels, and Moses is remaining behind and getting ready to die. And then here it is, Moses dies. And I love the fact that there's a lovely little verse in Hebrews 6 and verse 10. It talks about 6, 13. And it talks about how God is not unrighteous to forget the labors of those who ministered on his behalf. So Moses missed out on earthly Canaan, but I think it's kind of cool because once Moses died, next thing you know, God comes to him, as the story tells us. And God wakes him up from his death sleep. And I can imagine Moses seeing God and saying, oh, what, what, what are we doing? God's like, let's go. And Moses is thinking to himself, where are we going? And God's like, we're going to the real Canaan. And so even though he missed out on the symbol, in the end, he got the whole reality anyhow. God never forgets the labors of his faithful ones. But God had to deal with him justly when he lost his control. So it is when David loses control because of his passion for another man's wife and commits adultery. The Bible is filled with stories, not just of the great successes of these big names. When you think of Moses, you don't think of failures, but he did fail at times. 
When you think of David, you don't think of failures, but he did fail at times. And you know what happened? Both of them was based on the same thing, intemperance. They lost control of themselves in a moment, and it had years and years and years of negative impact. That's how serious it is that we must learn to control ourselves. Then there's this story, Esau. Esau loses control and gives up his birthright for a pot of porridge. These are, these are biblical stories of individuals who were mighty and powerful and blessed and anointed, but when they lost control of themselves, they suffered great, if not eternal losses. You know, when I think about some of the agitations we see in our world, funny enough, it always seems like around presidential election times, we always get these police brutality stories that start coming out and all these other things. And you know, we got elections next year, so I'm just a little concerned about what we're gonna see in society. You know, we see a lot about black civilians and white police officers, and there's a lot that people talk about with it. Now, I, as a black man, I think I'm an, I'm, I'm, I'm an authority to say what I'm about to say here. There are many cases where, sadly, police officers have pulled innocent individuals aside uh, and, and killed them and found out that they didn't have what they thought they had, you know, maybe a weapon or something like that. But I couldn't help but to notice something. There are tons and tons of stories like this where there's an officer and he's addressing an individual that he's getting ready to take to, you know, take into custody. And the individual begins to lose control and get upset to the point that he begins resisting and fighting the officer. And I always thought to myself, I said, if I were there, I would literally look that guy in the eyes. Because, you know, they say things like, you know, I'm tired of this. I remember, the, remember a man by the name of Eric Garner. Garner, Garner and, and he was the guy who got choked. And, and he came out with the words that people started putting on their T-shirts, I can't breathe. And I remember when I looked at his story, what caught me about the story was, yes, the police officers were at a place where they, they did some things they should not have done. Chokeholds were illegal in New York, so that guy should have been locked up under the jail. But nevertheless, when they kept telling Eric Gardner, you know, hey, we, we need to address you, Eric Gardner said this. He said, I'm tired of this, and it stops today. If I was privileged to be on the streets of New York that day, I would have said, bro, I understand you're upset. I understand that you're tired of this, but these guys surrounding you right now do not care about you. And they are waiting for you to get so agitated that they can have a reason to put their arms around your neck and choke you to death, which did happen, or to put a bullet in you. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is calm down right now. And I, I, would've, I would've counseled him, calm down, let them go through their process. If you're really innocent, when you go to the precinct, it will be proven, and then, by God's grace, you'll be able to hold them accountable. But in that moment of losing control, he lost his life, and now he has no fight to fight anymore. And so in my mind, I'm, I'm looking at the issue of self-control on another level. Yes, you might be tired of this. Yes, you don't want to be profiled, or whatever the case may be. And there are some cases where these guys did do wrong, and the police officers were completely right for pulling them aside and arresting them. But there were some cases where they were absolutely wrong. But it's in those moments you can't lose control of yourself. I told my boys, you know, I told my sons, I said, sons, I said, listen, our world is not fair. I said, I'm, just, I'm just telling you that right now. You can cry about it all you want. I said, our world is not fair. And sometimes you will be judged just by how you look. It's just the truth. I've had, I, 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 I was driving a car one time and a whole bunch of police cars stopped in front of me, and you see one guy come out the car, and he just takes a shotgun, he just aims it right at my face. And I remember I was in the car like, what in the world? And I'm just in the car, and my hands are frozen on the steering wheel. And I remember that I'm like, boy, I better not move. And then they come to the side of the door, I'm like, yeah, you know, of course I rode under, yes, take your hands off the wheel, I follow all instructions, I get out the car. Take me out the car, they start frisking me, looking through my car, and I said, can I ask a question? They said, sure. Why'd you pull me over? 
there was like five cops that was just, you know, everybody walking to me like this. And I remember that I asked the question, I said, why'd you pull me over? They said, somebody called us and said there was a black guy in the neighborhood driving in the car with a gun. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, I must have been an idiot. Like, I guess I was driving the car like, hey, you know, you know, just waving my gun. In other words, that's the most bogus story you could ever hear in your life. I was racially profiled, period, end of discussion. And so what I'm saying is, is that this stuff is real, but there's a lot of people that don't look like me that may not have that story. So I'm telling my boys, like, look, guys, I'm just telling you, you might, the world is not fair. And you might be profiled and treated a certain way. But I want you to understand me good when I give you your instructions. There are only two words that comes out of your mouth. I don't care what that cop calls you. And they were like, what's the two words, Dad? I said, yes and sir. I said, that's it. You don't say anything else. Or yes, ma'am, if it's a female. That's it. I said, I don't care if they call you everything but a child of God. You say yes and you say sir, and that's it. And then you let them take you to the precinct, you let us come pick you up, and then after we pick you up and you're safe in our arms, I assure you, if God wants to use me to execute some vengeance, we're going to make sure that we take care of all of those who did wrong. But that's the world we live in. But this, I, this constantly seeing people lose control of themselves, it's not helping the situation. It makes it worse, and I've learned something. Dead people cannot tell their side of the story. So that's just the reality of it. So on very practical levels, there's some issues when people lose control of themselves. How about this little one? Did you know that right now it is proven that too much screen time for young people can actually introduce symptoms to the mind of the youth beholding it that are similar to autism. Autism. In other words, screen time and young people, screen time is doing major damage to our young people. And it's not the fact that they have the screen time, but it's the fact that they don't have enough control over how much time they spend on the screen time. That's why when you look at this man right here, you know who that is. That's the late Steve Jobs, the creator of the Apple products. You know, one of these things that all these guys had in common, Business Insider says, interviews with Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Sundar Pichai, and other tech power players reveal that Silicon Valley parents are strict about technology use. Isn't that something? The people who created the products, they warned their kids, hey, don't spend too much time on this stuff. But here it is, we got parents today that sometimes are leaving tablets and phones in their children's laps and hands, and they're doing it for all these times. Lack of control, and it ends up doing damage to their brains. And so it is that when we talk about the power of self-control, wow, there's a lot of power, but there's also a lot of power in intemperance or lack of self-control. It, it didn't just affect Moses and David and Esau, it's affecting people even today in our society. So we really, really need to have more self-control. Now, things that negatively affect our ability to choose right. You know, in other words, what are some of the things that we put in our system that contributes to this lack of self-control. When I go through our books like Health Power, when I go through our books like the Encyclopedia of Foods and their healing power, one of the things that they're showing beyond any shadow of a doubt, one of the things that's especially hurting our youth is too much sugar. This is something we have to be guarded against because sugar's in bread, sugar is in pasta sauce, sugar is in just about everything, okay? Earlier in the week, we heard something about corn syrup or high fructose corn syrup. And these are products that we are seeing that are serious stimulants. In fact, ADHD, we know about ADHD, attention deficit hyper disorder. Did you know that food additives is one of the number one causes of ADHD? As far as food is concerned, food additives. What are food additives? You ever bought something and it says yellow? You ever seen yellow number five or blue number 40 and all these things? These are food additives. Very, very stimulating. There's something called excitotoxins. These things are not good for us. And sugar is definitely within that family. It is important to note that eating too much refined sugar can increase the risk of being depressed. 
The adverse effects are not only on your mood, but can also lead to some chronic health conditions. Consult with your doctor if you think sugar is causing you any health problems. So one of the things you really want to watch out for is how much sugar intake. It is harder. As a matter of fact, one, one of the big things with sugar, I forgot to mention this, sugar is also a thief, okay? Sugar is a thief. Now, does anybody know what sugar loves to steal? Say again? That is correct. Do you know which vitamins? Nope, not C. B, your B vitamins. Sugar gives you no nutrients. We're talking about refined sugars. They give no nutrients to you and I, but in order for sugar to be metabolized throughout the body, it requires B vitamins. So it literally begins to drain or zap or pull B vitamins from our system. And our B vitamins are good for our nervous system, okay? B vitamins are good for our nervous system. So you really wanna watch out for your sugar intake because it increases irritability and can cause us, if we're not careful with the brain fog, to not practice self-control in the times we need it most. Another food group, and boy, I know that looks delicious probably to some of us, but nevertheless, the reality is, is that fried foods, remember we talked about this last night, fried foods are not really good for the mind, they're not good for the brain. What we learned about it, People who frequently eat fried food, particularly potatoes like french fries, have a higher risk of anxiety or depression according to a new study. Specifically, the results showed that the frequent fried food consumption was linked to a 12% higher risk of anxiety and 7% higher risk of depression. So once again, you watch out for that fried food intake. Now, like I told you before, it's all right to treat yourself. If you know you've been doing good, you know that you've been eating very clean, and you have a moment, a day, a meal, that you say, I wanna get some french fries. You know, I'm, I'm gonna get some french fries from a place that, you know, McDonald's french fries, I found out a long time ago, was quite disheartening when I found this out. Um, I used to love McDonald's french fries. They were my favorite. I said, I don't know why, but they taste different from everybody else's french fries. Well, I found out why. <laughs> um, if, it, you know, Look up the ingredients to McDonald's french fries. One of the things that they put on it is beef stock. So they're taking some of the grease and whatnot from the beef and they're putting that on the fries. That's why they have this interesting taste that's different from all the other regular french fries out there. And the reality is, is that I used to treat myself to this stuff, you know, rewarding myself. Dwayne, you've been good, man. Go get some McDonald's french fries many years ago. But, you know, you, you want to pick good french fries where it's just a little bit of oil, maybe some added salt or not, and that's it, but don't go crazy on this stuff. Let that be a treat or a reward as a result of doing super good on your diet. So I'm not here to say don't ever get fried food, but I'm more so here to say please do not make this your frequent at all because it will work against us. Now, this includes fried tofu. Now, I'm not, you know, if, if you're using a, an air fryer, that. Yeah, I was about to say, that's different because the air fryer is not like deep frying. The deep frying is where you get the trans fatty acids, but the air fryer, you may not get the same thing. So I'm not talking about air frying. I'm talking about regular deep frying, dipping it all in the oils, etc. Be careful with that, family. Those things work against us, not for us, and it makes it harder for us in the balancing of our thought processes to make good decisions, especially all the time. So you want to be careful about your diet. What areas of our lives do we need to have control over? Well, here's a pie chart. You know how I came up with this pie chart? Because I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25, if any man strives for the mastery, he must be temperate or self-controlled in all things. Now, I want you to look at this pie chart because I think all of us can see here strengths and weaknesses. There's some areas on this pie chart we're very good at. There's some areas on this chart we are very weak at. So you need to decide what is it that I'm strong at, what is it that I'm weak at. Some of us have very good spiritual disciplines. We pray a lot, we study a lot, we share the Word of God with others a lot. We have very good spiritual disciplines. We attend church, we're the ones opening and closing the church. We have very good spiritual discipline. But some of us don't have good financial discipline. Maybe we are spendthrifts. We're far more consumers than producers. 
You got to look at it and say, what am I good at? What am I weak at? Family time. There's some individuals that don't even know how to connect with their children anymore. You know, young people change, right? Young people are not the little children that they were when they did all sorts of things with us. And as they get older, sometimes, a lot of times as parents, we lose connection with our children if we're not careful. So you want to find out, where is it that I'm weak at versus where am I strong? Mental cultivation. You got to keep yourself up there. Don't get mentally lazy. Mental laziness is, is, is a popular thing nowadays. But you want to do all that you can to say, am I still doing things that intentionally builds up my mental acumen to keep me mentally sharp, learning how to play an instrument or learning a new language? You know, lots of different things you can do to keep your mind sharp. When I fly on an airplane, I used to download some of these mind games that I would put on my, um, my iPad. And you know, it would, you know, like the things where you, it, it'll have patterns with numbers or patterns with colors. Like it'll do yellow and then blue and then green, green and then blue. And then I have to remember yellow and blue and green, green and blue. It's like, I like doing things like that. Those are little exercises that just helps me to just keep my mind a little sharp, you know, memory, et cetera, paying attention. But do what you can, work. Some of us are lazy and don't like to work. Some of us are hard workers and we overwork. So either way, we're intemperate. Socializing. How many of us have a good social life? God did not create us just three dimensions. He created us four. God did not just create us mental, physical, spiritual. He created us social. God is a social God. We should be social beings. We should be people who love people. And so some of us are not good at socializing. Physical. How many of us are taking care of ourselves? Don't let yourself waste away. Don't keep cheating yourself. It's like do what you can to take care of yourself. So again, if we're striving for the mastery, we must be temperate in all things, all of those areas. Look carefully at it and ask yourself, where is it that I'm very self-controlled? Where is it that I'm weak? Wherever you're self-controlled, keep up at it. Wherever you're weak, start working on it, okay? Now, one of the things that's connected with this word temperate uh, is to practice self-constraint, or self-restraint, rather, which also includes being regulated, regulated. What are some areas where we can practically apply temperance and regularity? Eating and drinking. I would like to recommend to you, try to be mindful of your eating and drinking habits. Take a look. Regularity in eating is of vital importance. There should be a specified time for each meal. So what you want to do is, if you know that you're going to eat at, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning for breakfast or whatever time, try to make that consistent because your body's going to start preparing gastric juices and all those things every day around the same time. Your body and my body loves regularity. So regularity in eating is of vital importance. There should be a specified time for each meal. At this time, let everyone eat what the system requires and then take nothing more until the next meal. Now, this is going to be huge for some of us. How many of us snack? All right, any snacks in the house? So when you snack on your foods, family, this can actually work against digestion and not for digestion. So let me give you an example. Remember I told you yesterday, if you eat a meal on, on your plate, you should have four things. Complex carbohydrate, protein, fat, vitamins, and minerals. All of that should be represented on your plate. If you're eating a full meal, it's going to take a minimum of five hours to go through a digestion process. Five hours. So, if you ate breakfast at 7.30 but finished at 8 o'clock, then you should allow five hours to go by without eating anything else. So if you finish eating breakfast at 8 a.m., nothing should go in your mouth in the name of food until 1 p.m. Not even a peanut or a potato chip. <laughs> Nothing goes in your mouth. Why? Because when you eat the food, right? When you eat the food, the gastric juices, everything else is helping to break down that food. So your body is chugging along and breaking down that food because once you start chewing, digestion begins in the mouth. Once you start chewing, all of the enzymes and everything else are getting ready for what's coming down. So when you start eating your food, your body's chugging along and breaking the food down, breaking the food down, and then two hours go by. 
your body is still breaking the food down. So here it is, your body's working along. Hey guys, we're doing good. And then what do we do? We say, oh, look at that, potato chips or, or a candy bar or something. And then we go ahead and bite and start chewing. The body sends the signals down and your body's saying, man, we're having a good, whoa. Hey guys, food's coming. So now your body has to get ready to have all things in place so that when that food comes down, it's ready to help break that down. But there's food over here. And that food begins to sit over a period of time and to putrefy, which is a cool word for rotting. Remember, you're 100 degrees, right? 98.6, when you take temperature, 98.6, we're basically 100 degrees. So you don't want to let food that you ate sit around too long unnecessarily in 100 degrees because it's going to start putrefying. It's going to start breaking down. And what ends up happening? Toxicity builds up. And what does it look like when that toxicity builds up? Man, it could be pimples coming out of our face. It could be brittle nails. It could be weak hair. It can manifest itself in so many ways. All of it because we are eating irregularly. So this is what we're talking about here, is once you have that meal, take nothing more until the next meal. So if you finish eating at 8 o'clock, don't eat anything else until 1 o'clock. Let the five hours go by and start doing it again. I did it with all four of our children when they were growing up. They all grew up fine. They were not malnourished. They were not punished. They grew up just fine. And every single one of them are as healthy as anything. So it, it, it works. I'm just letting you know, okay? Because we say, oh, if we do that to our children, we're punishing them. It's like, no, you're not. You're not punishing anybody. You're blessing them. You're not punishing them. You just let that meal go by. And my children's bodies were like clocks. I mean, once it got to the fifth hour, my children were like, Mommy, we're hungry. You know, they were ready to eat. But they didn't say anything until hour five. They were, they were fine because we fed them whole foods. They were not getting the white rice and the white bread and the white pasta, which is stripped grains that, that breaks down quicker. We were giving them the whole grains. That stuff holds you. It holds you good. And then five hours later, they're ready to eat and they did just fine. Now, it says there are many who eat when the system needs no food at irregular intervals and between meals because they have not sufficient strength of will to resist inclination. So this becomes very important for us. When we're talking about temperance in all areas, I wanna encourage you, space out your meals. Space out your meals. Also, well, I'm not gonna go there. I don't wanna overwhelm you. So space out your meals. When it comes to sleep, you got to get it, folks. Remember, the importance of regularity and the time for eating and sleeping should not be overlooked. Since the work of building up the body takes place during the hours of rest, it is essential, especially in youth, that sleep should be regular and abundant. So if you want to know how much sleep you should be getting, take a look at this. There goes your chart. From newborns to senior citizens, if whatever age group one is in, you go ahead and get the appropriate hours. If you're a toddler, 12 to 14 hours. Preschoolers, 11 to 13. School-age children, 5 to 12, you need about 10 to 11 hours of sleep. It's like you look at all of those different areas. If you're an adult, which is before senior citizen, 7 to 9 hours, more on the 9 side. If you're mature adults, which is more senior citizen, 7 to 9 hours, but you can be closer to the 7 side. But the key is get your sleep and you create a routine that you can get that sleep okay these are goals for our temperance goals for that self-control that we want to have okay he looks tired doesn't he <laughs> my brother looks overworked but that's another one in temperance in working okay there must be men who will begin a work in the right way and hold, it, and hold to it and push it forward firmly. Everything must be done according to a well-matured plan and with system. God has entrusted his sacred work to men, and he asks that they shall do it carefully. Regularity in all things is essential. Don't overwork yourselves. Don't overwork yourselves. Know when to start, know when to stop, and then to pick it back up the next day but be careful of overworking yourselves. When it comes to exercise, okay? Exercise is very important as well. 
People who exercise regularly have better mental health and emotional well-being and lower rates of mental illness. Exercise is important for people with mental illness. It, it not only boosts your, our mood, concentration, and alertness, but improves our cardiovascular and overall physical health. So we want to make sure that we're getting that exercise in. So we got a lot of things that we need to start planning. Now I'm going to let you in on the secret again. Remember, start small. Start with a goal so small that it's almost impossible to fail. I remember one time I wanted to get up to 50 push-ups without stopping. I was like, I want to get to 50 push-ups without stopping. So what do I try to do? I said, all right, well, let's just go. And I just go down on the ground. I'm like, huh, 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 huh. and I got up to about 30. And I got to 30 push-ups, good push-ups. But I was done. I was like, oh, man. And I just stopped. And I was like, oh, this is so hard. And then one day I learned about underachieving. And I decided to make the goal so small that there was no way I could fail at it. So I decided to do five push-ups a day for week one. So week one, five push-ups a day, and I was done. I knew I could do more, but I just did five. Week two, 10 push-ups. Week three, 15 push-ups. Week four, 20 push-ups. Before you know it, my body got so conditioned, I was able to do 75 push-ups nonstop, no problem. I was tricking, as it were, my own brain, let alone teaching my body how to endure this exercise but I started the goal very, very small. So don't be afraid of setting small goals so that way it's so small and so obtainable that it's almost impossible to fail at it, okay? Boosting your mood with food. Look at these food groups. These are all food groups that you can enjoy that are mood boosters, okay? So let's highlight a few of these guys. So let's talk about bananas, right? Bananas, it says bananas can increase the production of serotonin and dopamine, important neurotransmitters for happiness. And you know, maybe that's one reason why I'm such a happy guy, because I love bananas. <laughs> I enjoy bananas very much, it's one of my favorite fruits. Grapes, let's take a look at the grapes, what do they have for us? Grapes are full of vitamin C and natural sugars, both of which enhance mood and boost energy. One of my favorite nuts, almonds. Almonds contain good fats for skin and brain health. They also increase dopamine levels. Got that? And then let's look at avocados. How many of you like avocados? Oh yeah. Avocados are great for your skin and hair, but they also increase dopamine levels and increase endorphins. Now I eat avocados, but evidently I still don't have hair, so I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> but. I will say that all the other benefits of avocados I'm definitely experiencing. So, you know, go ahead and enjoy it. Now, I'm not one for dark chocolate only because of the caffeine, all right? But, you know, this is something that factually speaking does have some degree of benefit. Dark chocolate improves blood flow to the brain and is almost immediately noticeable in brightening your mood. And of course, the very last nut, which is the one that looks like the brain, walnuts. Walnuts have omega-3s and antioxidants, both of which have benefits. They also contain magnesium, which can reduce irritability, anxiety, and depression. So definitely get in your walnuts. I mean, those are very, very good superfoods, right? But these are things that you and I can do because the more your mind is at a state of peace, it's a lot easier to practice self-discipline. The more that your mind is irritable, the harder it is to practice self-discipline. So that's the reason why diet is always gonna come in as key to helping us practice good temperance. There's more in the good mood foods. These are even more. Chickpeas, olive oil, lentils, kimchi, and green tea. Again, dark chocolates up there. Apples, pumpkin seeds. I love pumpkin seeds. Men, make sure you get in your pumpkin seeds, all right? That's your zinc. All right, and we need zinc. Um, salmon, spinach, strawberries. I mean, there's just so much in the food world that helps us to make sure that we always maintain a good mood in our mindset so we can have the utmost health and be of the greatest benefit to God and to our fellow men, all right? Well, we talked a whole lot about temperance. How do we get it? <laughs> you know, how do we get it? Let me put it back up for you, Brother Joe, go ahead. You know, how do we get it, right? How do we get temperance? Because, you know, it's one thing for a parent to tell their child to behave themselves. It's another thing to show them how to behave themselves, right? 
So I like when I'm not just told to be something or do something, but I'm taught how to be it or how to do it. So it is when we deal with this question, how do we get temperance? The answer is very simple. There are a few things that I'm going to go ahead and give you that can help with this. On a very practical level, the first thing I would say is educate yourself with motivational material. Start watching stuff, listening to stuff, podcasts and different things, sermons, anything that's speaking about the subject that you know you really need to work on in your life. Try to start focusing your mind on it more, all right? So keep yourself surrounded with education that is motivational and inspiring and challenging and building you up. Number two, in the beginning, set small, easily achievable goals, like I told you. Set small goals. Don't, don't make big, gigantic goals. I'm going to work out 30. If you know you don't work out, keep it real. If you know you don't work out, don't come out of the gate and say, I'm going to do 30 minutes a day. It's like, you see, if you set the goal too big, you're either going to do one day where you're like, whoo, look at that, I did 40 minutes, and you're going to feel great. And next thing you know, you wake up the next morning, you got aches and pains and all this other stuff, and then you're like, oh, forget that. that. And now you're just discouraged. It's like, start small. Just start small. Just go ahead and say, I'm going to do, if you don't work out at all, start with five minutes. Start with 10 minutes. And just get used to it. Do a few days of five to 10 minutes of good exercise. Good exercise with your heart rate gets up and everything. It's very achievable. Then after that, next week or the week two, two weeks after, now go ahead and do some of the other stuff. And you'll be fine. You'll be at 30 minutes or beyond in no time fast. All right? But again, in the beginning, set small, easily achievable goals. Oh, I love this one. Number three, chronicle your successes. Write down, journal, if you will. Today I did A, B, and C. I didn't feel like doing it, what have you, but I did it, and now I feel fantastic about it. Chronicle your successes. I did not say chronicle your failures. Human nature has a way of doing that almost perfectly. All right? So don't chronicle your failures, but chronicle your successes. Lastly, on this point, remember, failure is a stepping stone to success, and try again. You know, if you, if you don't do it, don't go crazy. Don't, don't start beating yourself up a thousand times. Oh, I should have did it. I didn't do it. Listen, relax. We're in the game of life. Life is hard. We have a God that's on our side, but we have a devil that's against us every step of the way. Some of us have trained our minds to think negatively, and it takes time to start thinking positively. Give yourself grace. Don't beat yourself up if you fail. If you fall down, get back up and say, all right, we're going to do it again. If you set a goal, my goal every day, every day, my goal is I have to finish the full amount. But listen to this. <laughs> Not going to finish today. <laughs> you understand? 64. Now, I do 32 ounces in the morning, and then I do my 64. Now, I've had a lot of days where I had total success. I knocked that bad boy out. I got like 90-something ounces in. I am hydrated, right? I'm Mr. Hydration. So there were some days I'm good, but there's some days when I'm like, man, I didn't get it in today. So what am I going to do? Well, I guess I'm going to die. I'm probably going to get a blood clot and get a heart attack. You, no, I'm not doing I'm like, hey, Lord, I tried to get it in today. Didn't make it, but tomorrow we're going to do it again. And then you just go ahead and do it again. Don't sweat it. Don't beat yourself up. Just go ahead and try it again, right? But that's the bottom line is remember failure is a stepping stone to success. Try again. Just try again. No big deal. Just try it again, and you will find that you'll get better at it, okay? Also, and I'm so glad for this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and what's that last one? Temperance. Did you know that the Bible teaches that the Spirit of God, who is available for the asking, Luke 11, verse 13 says, ask. If you ask for the Spirit of God, I, I want to encourage you that if you have claimed Jesus as your Savior, you have every right to go to God every day and say, Lord, today I'm going to you know, try to do exercise, eat right, or whatever. I'm asking for your spirit to help me today, to just practice some self-control. And don't be afraid to involve, God loves to be involved in the daily practices of our lives. Go ahead and invite him in and say, Lord, help me today, that today I will make some good choices and not some bad ones. He will help you. 
God loves to be invited in our business, but he's a gentleman. He knocks and he says, will you let me in? If we let him in, then he can take over and do all sorts of great things on behalf of you and on behalf of me. Examples of temperance in closing. Examples of temperance. You know, how many of you are familiar with George Mueller? Familiar with George Mueller? The story of George Mueller is the most beautiful one. George Mueller was a man who uh, gave up a lot and wealth and things, and he decided to help many, many orphans. And he began to teach them the gospel, feed them, take care of them, a man of great sacrifice. Well, I found out that there's a man that's still alive today in Kenya who actually has done even more for orphans than George Mueller. Not that they were in competition, but it's just that he did. He's, he's, his, his work is far-reaching. Um, you can actually watch his story on Amazon Prime. He was extremely poor when he was growing up, and then through work and discipline and everything else, he became extremely rich uh, to the point that he could buy whatever he wanted, and he did for a period of time. And then he saw some poor kids on the street and his mind got thoroughly compassionate and convicted by God. And he decided to get rid of all of his wealth, which took major self-control. He decided, he had to teach his children and his wife, we are no longer going to live the luxurious life that we've been living. We are now going to let a whole bunch of children in our home. And he ended up doing such a large work that he almost transformed the beautiful country of Kenya and in, in the continent of Africa. His name and what you can find on Amazon Prime is Mully. You got to look this story up. It is beautiful. I mean, what an amazing story. What an amazing man. I have two trips to Africa for next year, and I'm hoping that I can get a chance to meet him. I'd love to meet him and talk with him. He is a Christian gentleman, and uh, he, he's just, it, it, his story is amazing. I mean, his story is absolutely amazing. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and watch it if you have like Amazon Prime or any of those things. And you'll see that this was a man who practiced self-control. He could have done anything he wanted with his money, but he decided not to. He decided to sacrifice and to go against what he was feeling. In his mind, he was saying no, but in principle, he said yes, and he sacrificed so that others could have. Then you have another man. Unfortunately, I wanted to meet this man too, but he passed away some years ago. But this man was also an individual who practiced tremendous self-control, a time in the military where everybody had to carry a firearm. But this man, because of his religious convictions, he wanted to be a conscientious objector. And he chose to not carry a weapon. But the amount of lives that he saved in war it is the most beautiful story. This man is named Desmond Doss. They made a movie about him. If you know this character on your right, um, you know, this is the young man who played Spider-Man and some other things in, in, the, in the world of entertainment, but uh, he played also Desmond Doss in a movie that was reflecting his life. A man who made a decision to say, I'm going to practice self-control so that I will go ahead and everything in him, I would imagine, would say, no, I don't want to sacrifice and do this. But nevertheless, he said yes. And he went out and he saved many, many lives with his bare hands without the use of a firearm. Just an absolutely amazing story. There are people alive today that have demonstrated great levels of self-control, self-mastery, self-discipline. And this tells me that the ability for these people to do it is the same ability for you and I to do it. We all can do this. I leave us in closing with some stories in the Bible. The Bible talks about a man that also had self-control. His name was Job. Job had a lot of stuff going on in his life. I would imagine that temptations were very high to doubt and question God and to challenge him and probably even to stop believing in him. But nevertheless, God says, listen, there's none on earth that is like Job, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and hates evil. And yet in all all that Job went through, in the end, as he suffered his losses, Job still had control over himself, that rather than cursing God, Job was able to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. This is an example of the power of self-control that is born from heaven. Then there's Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the princes of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
He said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Can you imagine how hard this test must have been? When you see all your buddies compromising and doing whatever the king wanted, and here it is, you and the minority have to stand alone and say that, you know what, we're going to practice self-control here. We're not going to do what everybody else is doing. We need a lot more young people like this, young people who will say, we're not going to do what everybody else in church is doing. We're not going to do what everybody else in the world is doing. We're going to do the things that we know to be right. It took Daniel tremendous courage and his fellows and lots of self-control to do what they did. It says, and for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And lastly, Christ himself. Going through the most fierce battle of his life, he's getting ready to finally have the Father look at him in displeasure, and it was crushing him. It got him to the point that so much pressure was upon him that it caused blood vessels to pop and the blood would mix with his sweat. But even when he was going through that, Jesus was still able to say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. The Bible says he's an high priest that was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he never sinned. Temperance is real. Temperance is something that's available to each of us. And yes, we may not find all the examples that we would like to see in the world to show us it, but through the surrender of the will, to just simply say, Lord, I want you to take control of my life. I want you to help me. I want you to help me so that I can practice that same self-control like Job, like Daniel, like Jesus, like Molly, like Desmond Doss, and like many, many others, so that we can go ahead and paint our side of the story as we go through Earth's journey preparing for the eternal life. And so I just want you to know, total temperance is possible, but it comes at a cost. And it comes at a complete surrender of not my will, but it comes as a surrender to God's will. And I believe that if any of us are willing to do that, you will be amazed at what can be accomplished through you, in you, for God's glory and for the favor of your fellow man. And so tonight, I'm just going to say how many of us would like to see not just partial self-control, but to have total temperance. Is that any of us in this room to say, hey, I want to have total temperance. Well, God bless you. Why don't we go ahead, let's stand together and let's close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask God to bless you to have that experience of total temperance beginning tonight and throughout the remainder of your lives. And let's do all that we can to help each other along the way. Okay, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much that total temperance is possible. Lord, we know that there's lots of examples around us where we will not see total temperance, including the example we behold in the mirror. But we are going to trust your words, and we're going to believe that by your grace, it is possible that we can have total control over ourselves, to have true self-discipline and self-mastery. But it's not going to be just through the exercise of our will but it's going to be through the power of your spirit. We invite him to come into our hearts, and may you help us. Bless everyone now as they go home, help them to get back home in safety, and we pray that they will find their homes in safety, that there will be no hurt, harm, nor danger that has come to it. And bring us back tomorrow at 4 o'clock where we can enjoy an amazing cooking class where we get to taste a lot of these wonderful plant-based foods and be inspired, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.